Again, welcome to EPI Research Method course. In this lecture, we're going to cover the research goals in epidemiology. Again, this materials cover chapter two of our course textbook. So our main objective is to use the research goal as the organizing principles of a study design. Also, we are going to distinguish between general research goals. And there are four different types. Also, we're going to explain the requirement for causality and also to realize the practical limitation of a research goal. So again, there are four types of research goal, descriptive, association, causa, and evaluation. So a descriptive research goal is intended to describe the health phenomena in terms of its distribution across person, place, and time. And normally the health problem is typically measured as incidence and also a prevalence. So again, descriptive research goal, main goal is to describe the health phenomena, not to find or analyze uh, the relationship between exposure and outcome or the risk factors and the disease, but rather for us to understand the phenomenon, the health phenomenon. So the incidence normally will be the number of new cases of a health phenomenon during a specific period or point in time among those at risk for the phenomenon. Uh, so to find the incidence normally to be the number of new cases in a time period divided by the number of people at risk at the start of the period. Incidence is very difficult to measure because first, most important, we have to understand what is a new case. So for a very simple example, let's say we have uh, patients with HIV in a community and we want to know the incidence of HIV cases in the community. Uh, first of all, we have to know what is the new case. Is it if a person have HIV in the past two weeks or past year or past six months will be considered as a new case. So the time period is very important. Now, the next one, which is the prevalence. Prevalence doesn't matter. So prevalence will be the, all the number of existing cases of an earth phenomenon at a particular time, not a period of time. So a very simple example, again, we have patients with HIV in a community, total patients with HIV, let's say it's 100, and the population is 1,000. So the prevalence will be 100 divided by 1,000. Now, if new cases out of the 100 is 20, and then maybe around 800 uh, behavior is very high risk to getting HIV, then the incidence will be 20 divided by 800. So when we look at the formula, we can see that incident is the number of new cases in a time period and divided by number of people at risk at the start of the period. So we are not dividing by the whole population by number of people or the population that at risk of having the problem. But with prevalence, it will be number of cases at particular time, all the cases totally at a point of a time, particular time. Now divided by the total population size at the same period uh, time, at the same particular time. And uh, so what we mean by person and places, here we say we define the characteristics that suggest hypothesis. So a person characteristics can be and social demographic characteristics such as uh, its income, uh, other behaviors, factors, other uh, biological factors also, uh, maybe it's, uh, race or height, weight, etc. So these are all be a person characteristics. A place normally will be a geographical location, a physical location. So let's say. In a South Bronx, we have a, an incident. Uh, in Manhattan, there's an incident, so it to be a particular physical location. 
then when we talk about time, it will be either the particular time or uh, period of time, the interval. So the time can be in hours, uh, a day, year, or historical period, uh, season, trend, etc. So let's see one example here. In this example, we are going to do a, a research on obesity. So obesity research. Uh, here we say increasing incidence and also prevalence among American youth. So now epidemic means the prevalence and the incidence are greater than what is expected. Uh, I would say the normal rate. Let's say we have a, a community, and in this community we know in normal cases, only 1% of the population are obese. And as time goes on, there is some stage, now we are having over 20% of the population obese or 50% is increasing. Then in this case, we are having what we call epidemic. So epidemic, again, the prevalence and the incidence will normally be greater than the normal rate or what is expected historically. So this is an example of uh, studies that was done, uh, increase in a child with obesity. Uh, we can see from 1971 to 2008, they have been increasing in all the three age groups. So our first dark solid line is between two to five years old. Then we have the light, uh, the light solid line, six to 11. Then we have the broken line, 12 to 19. But again, when we look at the data, we can see that from 1971 to 2008, there's increase in obesity, mostly among the age group of six to 11, and also 12 to 19. Two to five is okay, but they're still increasing, but not rapid. Uh, so the person in this example, the person in this studies was Hispanic boys and also non-Hispanic black girls. And the youth with autism and also Down syndrome. And so here we are coming up with again our descriptive research for the person, place and time. So the main goal again about descriptive research is try to understand the health phenomena. Now the place will be the rural areas in West, Western Canada. And this example, the time is epidemic among US youth since the 1970s up to 2000, somewhere around 2008. So normally in epidemiology and research work, we always start with a descriptive research because that would be the main starting point for us to understand the problem we are facing, the health phenomena. Most important, the place, person, and time need to be identified. Also, the, we come up with the questions and also the hypothesis generated. Again, with descriptive, we are not testing hypothesis, but rather we are generating it. So in these studies, our question and hypothesis said, what are, what are the cultural or genetic or biological reasons for elevated prevalency of obesity among Hispanic comparing to other boys. Maybe biological issue or the environment. So are the rural residents of Western Canada less active than their urban counterparts? Are there relevant social demographic differences? And also what relevant factors have changed for US youth since the 1970s? Is it a fast food diet? Or 
entertainment, uh, sedentary activities for entertainment, maybe increase in uh, entertainment that doesn't involve physical activities such as playing game instead of playing soccer. Also, so that would be decrease in school gym classes, also availability of fresh produce. So again, this can be from here, we can come up with the again, questions or generate the hypothesis. Then next, we we'll move on to association research goals. Now in statistics, we know that we said it's something that tell us that association between two variables doesn't mean there's a causality. So maybe there can be association between ice cream sales and shark attack in Florida. But we cannot say that buying an ice cream or taking an ice cream, it can lead you to have a shark attack if you go to the beach. Uh, in this case, we may have our third variable, which is the weather. When the weather is warm, sales of ice cream increase. At the same time, uh, the shark attack incidents also increase. Uh, so this is what we call the co-funding variable, third variable causing the distortions, which will again come to it. So association research goals. Now here we want to find an association between the exposure and the outcome. Again, in the descriptive research goal is for us to understand the health phenomena. Most important is the person, place, and also time. Then possible generate hypothesis or questions. Now in association research goal, we want to find out if there's any relationship or association between the exposure or the risk factors and also uh, the outcome. So that would be the next important research goal in epidemiology after descriptive research. In a, again, association research, we want to determine factors that are associated with or related to mortality or morbidity. So we have some few terms here. Uh, we risk factors, again, those are the, uh, the causes we want to find out, the causes of the disease or the outcome. And there's a way we can, again, we will go through the measure of associations can use host ratio, attributable risk, and even prevalence and uh, incidence to measure the association, how the strength of the association between the, the exposure and also the outcome. Confounding variable is very important. Confounding variable sometimes can lead us to a bias. We always, our goal is to eliminate it. So we, when we are doing research, our goal is to eliminate co-founding variable because that will be the third variable that can create association between two variables but there's no causation mm -hmm. also we have the effect modification which also sometimes is called the interaction so effect modification is very good if we can identify those attributes or the variables to be very good in a sense that effect modification either increase or decrease the outcome. So a very example, a simple example would be, we know cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. So the exposure will be smoking, the outcome is lung cancer. Now, if there's a medicine or there's something that we can take that anytime we smoke and we take that liquid or medicine, it reduces the chance of getting lung cancer, which means it brings that depress it. Or there's something that if we take after smoking cigarette, it increases the chance of first getting a, a lung cancer. This would be effect modification or interaction. Doing research is very good to know this and it helps 
to solve the problem. But co-founding variable again, it's not a something we, it's more or less like a bias, something we're trying to eliminate. So again, risk factors are exposure that are associated with a disease. And also risk factors are especially relevant, very relevant for epidemiologic research because the etiology of most disease is a complex combination of causes and potential uh, causes. So risk factors for health phenomena, here we say exposure associated with a health problem. Uh, one can be a genetic, behavioral. Behavioral is very common, for example, cigarette smoking or alcohol, drug abuse. Also contact with infectious or toxic agents and life conditions. Now criteria for risk factors, we can have the dose response relationship those response relationship or correct temporal order of exposure and disease. And when we say the temporal, we mean the timing period order of exposure and also disease. So again, there's always a dose and response relationship. We say the higher the level or intensity of exposure, then the higher the probability or severity of the disease. Then the temporality of the exposure and disease are appropriate also. Now the relationship not due to something else, not measured. So the observed relationship between exposure and the disease is not due to some source of error in the design or conduct of the studies. So in epidemiology studies, again, measures of association tests, relationship between expression and, and outcome. So measures of association always will test, uh, I will use the term even the strength of the relationship between expression and outcome. Normally we call this two by two table. Let's say in this case, we have an expose, uh, it can be exposed to cigarette or toxic uh, agent. So we have a, a person exposed and not exposed. So a person exposed and has the outcome is A. Then a person exposed but does not have outcome is B. A person is not exposed but has the outcome is C. Uh, not exposed does not have the outcome is D. So the good one is AD, because A, you are exposed and you have the outcome. D, you are not exposed and you don't have the outcome. Now, this will be a research that we do and we take a data. And A can be any number of patients, B, C, D. Now, if we want to find the risk ratio of the exposed, then it will be A divided by A plus B. A plus B will give us the total patients that are exposed. So if I divide A by A plus B and the value is very small, then B divided by A plus B, that tells me that the exposure is not too strong because if I'm exposed, and I don't have outcome B is larger than A, then that means the exposed is not that, it's weak. But if A is way greater than B, then the exposed is strong. And that's what we use to find the risk ratio. So you can see that in risk ratio, we divide A by A plus B, then we divide C by C plus D, because C is when you are not exposed, but you have the problem, divided by total patients that are not exposed. So if A divided by A plus B is greater than C divided by C plus D, then we can say that the exposure is very strong. And this will be the prevalence or incidence of outcome for the exposed group divided by prevalence or incidence of the outcome for the unexposed group. Also, we have what we call the risk differences, which we can use to measure an association, association between exposure and outcome. 
And you can see that we are using the same formula, but this time we are finding the difference of it. So it will be A divided by A plus B minus C divided by C plus D. So it's the prevalence or incidence of outcome for the exposed group minus the prevalence or incidence of the outcome for the unexposed group. Uh, we also have the attributable risk, which will be A divided by A plus B minus C divided by C plus B divided by A divided by A plus B. So because we are dividing by the difference of those uh, prevalence or incidence of exposed and unexposed, then we divide by the strength of the prevalence or incidence of a prevalence or incidence of exposed group, it becomes a proportion. So this will be a proportion of the prevalence or incidence of the outcome for the exposed group. We find the difference of prevalence or incidence of exposed minus prevalence or incidence of an exposed group divided by prevalence or incidence of exposed group. So that will give me the proportion. Now, we also have the population attributable risk, which will be, yeah, we are using the whole population. So we have A plus C. A plus B, A plus C is the total of patients who have the outcome. So A plus C divided by total population. Then minus C divided by C plus D. Then we divide that by A plus C divided by total population. And this will give again proportion of the total prevalence or incidence that can be attributable to the exposure. So next we we'll move to what we call the confounding variable. So again, confounding variable is always present when a third factor or the variable distorts the relationship between an exposure and the disease. So the distortion can take the form of error that is inflating or deflating the strength of association between the exposure and disease. And again, consequently, cofund is often a form of systematical error or bias. So when a third factor or a variable distort the relationship between exposure, exposure and the disease, Again, that would be an error. So example here, we have exposure and a disease, then we have a confounding variable. So unrecognized and also unadjusted confounding result in a biased relationship between the exposure and the disease. So ADA is going to inflate the strength of the association between the two, the exposure and the outcome, or deflate it in strength of the association between, again, the exposure and the outcome. Now, how do we test for confounding variable? And the most common method is use the stratified analysis. A stratified analysis uh, here means, for example, we talk about, uh, let's say, smoking and coffee. We identify that smoking and coffee can cause lung cancer. Now we have at least the third variable coffee. So this analysis means I'm, I will take only coffee with the outcome. So look for a sample of patients that have lung cancer, but they take only coffee. Then we look at patients who take only cigarette and they have the lung cancer. So here we are trying to break uh, the variable separately. So that's what we call stratified analysis. A very good example would be a data was collected and we found out that uh, men are more prone to malaria and malaria disease than women in a farming community. And so now we want to say, okay, then that means there's a relationship between gender and uh, malaria disease. But there may be a confounding variable here. 
we did a stratified analysis, and we found out that most people that work outdoor have malaria disease often than those who work indoor. And it happens that majority of the people who work outdoor are male. And majority of the people who work indoor are female. So still we have a relationship between the gender and malaria disease. But again, the main cause is mosquito. If you work outdoor, you get more mosquito bite than if you work indoor. But how can we identify this? We can use the concept of straight for analysis, whereby again, we break the possible variables. Sometimes we consider age, other possible factors. In this case, we consider the employment location, outdoor or indoor. So stratify the data according to the co-founder and compare the adjusted or stratified relationship between the exposure and disease with the crude relationship between exposure and disease with that adjustment for the co-founder. Now here we say that if the strength of the adjusted measure of association differ from the crude by more than 10%, then we can say co-founding is present. So this example for testing for co-founding. Here there was a test uh, done, a research work, and they found out that the male baldness has risk factor for throat cancer. So when we look at the data set here, we can see that bald with, uh, with throat cancer is 90, and uh, bald with no throat cancer is 60. Not, uh, not bored, but to cancer is 60. Not bored and no cancer is 90. So the normal go up when they are not, not bored, no cancer is higher. And so here, uh, to make it short, we can consider a second variable. How can person get bored? But majority of the people who are bored are old. So we can consider age also. So, so we can do our straight for analysis and consider the age. So yeah, when we do the, we calculate the crude risk ratio based on the data given, which will be 90 divided by the total 150 divided by those who have um, board, but no cancer is 60 divided by that total also is 150. So we get 1.5 which means the board 50% uh, chance more to have to have uh, throat cancer if you are bored. But here, as we said, age can be a factor. So here, what we did, we break the data into two. We consider age now. If you are 50 plus, and if you are less than 55, sorry, if you are 55 plus, yes, and if you are less than 55. So when we collect the data, we divide it by age. This is what we get for both. Now, when we find the risk ratio, we find out that those who are less than 55 is 1.0. And those who are, sorry, those who are greater than 55 or more, uh, less than 55, is one based on the again the data given here. Then the also then the other is one point five based on the data given. So there's a decrease in about thirty percent because previously we find the crude risk ratio to be one point five, but when we break it in the age less than fifty five years old from 1.5 to 1.0, so 30% decrease. So we can say here that, remember we say when it's 10% or more, then there's confounding exists. So with 30%, we can say yes, age can be a confounding variable in this case. So most likely age rather have more association with throat cancer than being bored and also be bored associated with age and also. Now the next step is how do we prevent 
prevent co-founding. We are the same can possible measuring the potential uh, co-founding or using the matching method. And also we can use the random selection. Also, we can control for co-founders in data analysis, as we said earlier, using the stratified analysis. Or we can also use a multivariable analysis, a concept of a regression, logistic regression concepts. And we may discuss about this more detail in our future uh, chapters. Again, we have a special chapter for co-founding and modification effect, and we may discuss this more detail. So effect modification or modification effect, which is also called interaction, and the whole concept here is that this is a very good, if we can discover effect modification in our search goal, then we are getting close of solving the problem or understanding that's the, the cause. So here we say effect modification is there. That's a meaningful result comparing with co-founding. It has a direction, strength, or start significance of association between an exposure and disease, differ between subgroups, and also defined by third variable. So again, effect modification is a very, very good sense. So when we are doing research, we always want to identify it. So why an unrecognizing co-founding relationship can be a bias in a study, effect modification it's a meaningful result, always oh, very good. So effect modification is present if the strength or the direction of relationship between exposure and disease differ for subgroups of a third factor. Example can be a gender or age group. So we have example here for Framingham Heart Studies. Here in this example of studies that was done, they found out that the risk factors of a cardiovascular disease, CVD, can be obesity, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, advanced age can be one of the risk factors, stress and the use of oral concept, contraceptives and monopause, diabetes, cigarette smoking, chronic, and more. Now, there can be a confounders and also effect modifiers in relationship with risk factors and CVD. Example can be cigarette smoking. Because maybe uh, smoking cigarettes may also cause some adverse effects on our head or aging or gender or different types of various sources of stress and again, what are more examples? So next we move to causal research goals. Actually, this is, uh, that's what we said here. This is the main goal of epidemiology research. We want to know the cause, the cause and effect. Uh, this outcome was caused by these factors or this exposures. So the ultimate goal of epidemiology research is to determine the causes of morbidity and also mortality. So confidence that a factor is truly caused depends on, again, a very serious and regular study design, repetition of, of studies showing the same results they have to be consistent and also strict criteria that we can use. So here, validation or validity, reliability, very important, the rule of scientific method. And also we must have a criteria for again causality. Although the valid and reliable studies is the idea for all research goals, whether descriptive association Causal evaluation, but accuracy and precision, and again, accuracy and precision are vital to make inferences about causalities. 
So confounding bias is a relationship between the exposure and disease will compromise the status of an exposure as a true cause. And also scientific method here, the discussion of a scientific method is particularly informative in the context of appreciating what is required to infer a causal relationships. So criteria for causality is very, very, again, important. So again, validity and reliability. We talk about the systematic error and random error. This need to be addressed. And also threat to demonstrating causality. And this can be if we have a wrong sample or our instrument and wrong measures or wrong analysis, the methodology or the techniques we use to analyze the data was incorrect. This can again cause a validation problem and errors also. And also the role of scientific method, as we said earlier again, observable result. In terms of observable results, it can be evaluated for validity and reliability. And also we should be able to replicate our results. So consistency, replicable results, stronger support if results are replicated, especially across different conditions. So the criteria for a rele are relevant for spraying the, spraying the infectious disease, but infectious diseases are only part of the focus of epidemiology. So these are the criteria for causality. And this was formulated by Ellie Koch postless that an infection agent must be present in every case of the disease. Also isolated and grow in a pure culture. So again, criteria for causality, we have to make sure, again, agent must be present in every case of the disease. It can be isolated and grow in a pure culture. And the cause of the disease, when introduced into a healthy host, we should see, this would be an experiment, we should see the disease if, the, in this case, other bacteria or virus is given to a healthy host, we should see the, uh, the effect of the disease. Also rec recoverable and grow again a pure culture. Now criteria for causality by Sir Hosting Bradford Hills, general criteria said the strength of the association between exposure and disease is very important. Also, as we mentioned earlier, consistency. So you have consistency in observing the association in multiple investigations. Also the association is specific to a particular person, places, time, and all the health phenomena. The exposure present pre 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 in time, the development of the disease. Also we should consider the dose response, uh, response or biological gradient in linear relationship. So example giving you a smoking and a lung cancer. And the strength of the association, here we say smokers were nearly 10 times more likely than non-smokers to have a lung cancer and 18 times more likely to die from lung cancer. This was an, a data that was analyzed, came up this result. Now more than 90% of lung cancer deaths and more smokers were attributable to smoking. And also the consistency across the investigation, we can use the case control or prospective cohort or biological markets. Again, we may discuss this in our future lectures, what is a case control studies. Normally case control studies means we may have the case that's patients with the problem or with exposures 
and the control will be people without the problem or the, the case. Then we can again do our research and find out the difference between the two. And normally we use what we call the hybrid studies. We can use case control with cohort studies. The cohort, we have two types, which we will talk about prospect. Prospective cohort means, a cohort study means we have to do a studies and monitor our sample for some period of time. It can be a year, a week, one year. Prospective cohort means we are looking into the future. Then we have retrospective cohort, uh, which means, uh, let's say a patient, the patients have disease A. Now we want to go back to analyze his behavior, where he's been to, his normal lifestyle, what lead to the problem. So we do our analysis going historical. So that's called retrospective goals. And we may discuss, discuss about that. So specificity will be the lung cancer associated with cigarette smoking but not with inhalation of sulfuric acid. Then the temporal order of exposure disease, that will be the time period. So in this case, as we said, result of prospective core studies. So we monitor them 10 years, five years. Then the dose response relationship will be the greater, the number of cigarette smoke, which will be the dose then the highest likely of death due to lung cancer, which will be the response. So now our final research goal, which is most important also, evaluation research goal. And so here we say to prevent and minimize death and also disease. That's the main goal of epidemiologists. Do analysis, investigate, risk factors and outcome, recommendation given, et cetera. The goal is to again minimize the number of death and disease. So the most important goal of epidemiology as a field is to discover ways to prevent morbidity and mortality, as we said earlier. Now, once the cause is identified, the next step will be the prevention efforts can be developed to eliminate or minimize the cause, thereby preventing or minimizing the health phenomena. However, even with a known and confirmed cause, the prevention program will not be effective if it does not affect the cause. So again, the purpose of, of an evaluation study is to determine whether or not the program is efficacy or efficacious, which is effective change for those receiving the treatment. So that's again the evaluation process. So use result of studies demonstrating causes or risk factors and also prevention should modify these causes or risk factors and also desired modification should prevent or minimize the health problem. So evidence-based prevention. Efficacy, as we said, is the specific goal of evaluation studies. So effective change for those receiving the treatment and not for those not receiving the treatment. Next is experimental design. This will also be the strongest design for demonstrating efficacy because with experimental design, again, we can control or manipulate our input and output. In this case, our risk factors or exposure and see the response or the outcome. So it's a stronger design for demonstrating efficacy. And also we can have the pre-test, post-test. So for example, before the experiment, we do a test after the experiment and treatment or whatever controls, uh, et cetera, then we can do our poster C theater. Also randomization and control group can help with the evaluation. 
So there was an example here, that's the evaluation of drug abuse resistance education. This is analysis of result of experimental evaluation. And this program was funded somewhat in 1983 in Los Angeles. And it has proven to be very successful that it is now being permitted in 75% of our nation's school districts in more than, again, 43 countries around the world. This is a school-based drug abuse prevention program. So practical limitation of research goals. Yes, we have some practical, almost every, uh, every research, there can be a limitation or constraints at our resources or technology is not available to. So one mistake, even season, a very high experienced researchers sometimes make is to draw implication from their study results that go beyond the original research goal. So for example, a descriptive study can suggest, but not actually the tests test the association between exposure and disease. So an association study does not demonstrate causality. And also an evaluation study without essential limit of an experiment, experimental design does not demonstrate efficacy of the intervention. So we have to consider all this. So exercise caution to not overreach in interpretation of result because we know descriptive studies cannot demonstrate causality. Also association study cannot demonstrate efficacy. So again, that will be the end of our lecture number two, which cover again, chapter two of our course textbook. So again, wish everybody the best and thank you.